Hello, I'm Nick, and this is Today in Philosophy of History for Sunday, 31 March 2024. It is the 110th anniversary of the birth of Nathan Rotenstrike, who was born in Sambir in the Ukraine on this date in 1914. I only recently learned about the work of Rotenstrike. I found a reference to his work in A Behavioral Approach to Historical Analysis by Robert F. Berkhofer, which I just happened to find at a used bookstore not long ago. So some books I value for their arguments, but others have been valuable to me because of the other books that they make me aware of. And this book by Berkhofer has proved to be uh, valuable for what it made it aware of. So I found in here, quote, books on historical methods rarely discuss the nature of time nor do recent philosophies of history, except for Nathan Rotenstrike's Between Past and Present, an essay on history, who bases his whole book on the concept, unquote. So, since one of my preoccupations in uh, philosophy of history is the relationship between time and history, this obviously piqued my interest. And after reading it, I managed to find a reasonably priced copy of Rotenstrike's Between past and future, excuse me, between past and present, an essay on history. Uh, but I don't yet have my own copy of Rotenstrike's Time and Meaning in History. And since Rotenstrike's work is new to me, I can't really make any kind of comprehensive assessment of it, but I did want to discuss two ideas that immediately drew my attention. I've already mentioned... Uh, what Berkhofer wrote about uh, Rotenstrikes on the relationship between time and history. And in my episode on philosophy of history before Augustine, I argued that there is a disconnection between philosophy of history and philosophy of time. The two ought to be tightly coupled in philosophical thought, but they aren't. And this strikes me as odd. In previous episode, I have mentioned two exceptions to this disconnection. One is the exception of St. Augustine, who formulated a philosophy of history in the City of God and a philosophy of time in his Confessions. Another exception is Husserl, for whom philosophy of time, or rather a phenomenological analysis of time, was central to his phenomenological project. And then in his last years, Husserl turned his attention to the problems of history. However, neither Augustine nor Husserl systematically bring together their philosophies of time and history so that we can see how each works with the other as, you know, you could say a seamless whole. We could, after the fact, work through the philosophies of time and history of Augustine and Husserl and try to show them to be of a piece, expressing the same presuppositions of thought of each, and this would be a worthwhile project to undertake. But the fact that neither Augustine nor Husserl did do this implies that neither of them thought it would, uh, neither of them either thought to make the connection or neither of them thought it would be worthwhile to spell it out. So maybe they thought that the connection was too obvious to saddle it with an exposition. Honestly, I don't know, uh, but it is a rare thing. And from what I have read of Rotenstrike so far, he is explicit about formulating a philosophy of time and then applying this philosophy of time to history, to yield a philosophy of history that is derived from a philosophy of time. And it was this suggestion of making the connection in that I found in Berkhofer's book that immediately grabbed my attention. And so far from what I've read, I haven't been disappointed by Rotenstrike. The other idea that immediately stood out to me was how Rotenstrike opens his between past and present with a distinction that's familiar in the philosophy of history, but has been formulated slightly differently in each context in which it appears. In my first episode of the series, uh, in which I recommended top books, uh, 10 books for getting started in philosophy of history, I mentioned uh, uh, Walsh's Philosophy of History and Introduction and William Dray's uh, Philosophy of History. And both of these books 
begin with a familiar distinction between two senses of history, which I often summarize as history as past actuality and history as the narration or record of past actuality. Walsh makes the distinction like this, quote, I must point out the simple and familiar fact that the word history is itself ambiguous. It covers one, the totality of past human actions, and two, the narrative or account we construct of them now, unquote. So Walsh calls past actuality the totality of past human actions, and the narrative of past actuality he calls the narrative or account we construct of past human actions now. But then Walsh also adds a little further on that an inquiry into this narrative or account might occupy itself with the processes of historical thinking. And it seems obvious that the processes of historical thinking are distinct from a narrative constructed of past human actions. So already we're running into complications. William Dre makes the distinction as follows, quote, an introduction to philosophy of history must begin by distinguishing two senses which the word history commonly bears. On the one hand, we use it to refer to the course of events, a certain stratum of reality which historians make it their professional business to study. On the other, we use it to denote the historian's study itself. We mean by it a certain kind of inquiry into a certain kind of subject matter, unquote. And another um, philosopher found to make, I have found to make this distinction is uh, Maurice Mandelbaum. And Mandelbaum says, quote, history has come to have two fundamentally different meanings, the one referring to occurrences in the past and the other referring to the knowledge or supposed knowledge of these occurrences, unquote. That's from a 1952 paper titled The Philosophy of History, Some Neglected philosophic problems regarding history. While all of these distinctions in the senses of history aren't exactly the same, they are similar. So the concepts overlap, but even though they overlap, there's areas where they don't overlap. So you could say the areas of, of mutual independence of these concepts, and also ellipses that aren't covered by the concepts at all. Walsh, Dre, and Mandelbaum all use the distinction in the senses of history to make a corresponding distinction in the kinds of inquiry called philosophy of history. Walsh and Dre both call this uh, distinction the distinction between critical and speculative philosophy of history, and Mandelbaum calls it the distinction between formal and material uh, philosophy of history. And Arthur Dianto also made an analogous distinction between what he called analytical and substantive philosophy of history. And we could infer back from Danto's distinction between kinds of philosophy of history to implicit senses of history from which this distinction could be derived. So not only do we have this distinction between senses of history, but we also have distinctions among the kinds of inquiry generated by these two senses of history. And each of those has their own concept to identify it. So it starts to get even more complicated. For Rotenstreich, even though he doesn't use the distinction to talk about two different kinds of philosophy of history, we could say that his distinction in forms of inquiry you know, implied by what he does say is the difference between res geste and Historium Rerum Gestorum, which he takes over from Hegel. So Rotenstreich prepares the ground for his distinction in the sense of history by, by quoting Hegel. Quote, the starting point of this discussion will be Hegel's observation, and then he quotes Hegel, quote, quote, in a quote, in our language, the term history unites the objective with the subjective side and denotes quite as much the historium rerum gestorium as the res geste themselves. On the other hand, it comprehends not less what has happened than the narration of what had happened. This union of the two meanings we must regard as of a higher order than of mere outward accident, unquote. 
So Hegel is bringing in the objective and the subjective, in, which is another set of concepts. And Rotenstreich uh, largely takes over uh, Hegel's use of objective and subjective in his exposition of making the distinction in senses of history. In the 1978 paper uh, titled Historical Actions or Historical Event, Rotenstreich revisits this distinction. He writes, quote, history as res geste is a forward-looking action occurring against the background of given events, that is to say, of results of actions which occurred previously. History, as a narration of rerum gestarum, is an attempt to look at events as results of action or to find the causal or hermeneutic relationship between events which are the point of departure of our investigation or observation and the actions which resulted in the events. But Rodenstreich isn't really interested in establishing different kinds of philosophical inquiries into history as we find the, the senses of history distinction made by Walsh and Dre and Danto and Mandelbaum. And it seems like from my first glance into Rotenstreich that his interest in, in making this familiar distinction is related to his interest in giving an account of history based on an explicitly developed philosophy of time. So again, this is, inter this is interesting, but I'm citing these examples of the different senses of history in order to make a point. And the point is this. Whenever a philosopher makes a distinction that is not based on a logical disjunction, that is to say, it is not a distinction between a proposition P and the negation of P, as we would have in the example of it is raining, which is P, and it is not the case that it is raining, which is not P, or the negation of P. If you don't have that explicit kind of logical formulation, the distinction then is based on a non-logical concept. And here by non-logical, I don't mean illogical or irrational. I mean a concept that is not specifically logical, or if you like, a concept that is not reducible to a purely logical conception. If a purely logical distinction is made, we can reduce it to a formula and we can manipulate it according to the rules of logical inference. But even here, there's some wiggle room because if we deny bivalence, the claim that there are two and only two truth values of propositions, the true and the false, or if we deny the principle of the excluded middle, also known as tertium non detur, according to which a proposition is either true or false, then the logical distinction opens out onto further possibilities. So to pursue this any further would take us into the distinction between constructive and non-constructive reasoning, which is relevant to the philosophy of history, but I am going to save that for another time and not pursue it further at the moment. Because all of this is just to point out that there are potential complications even in a logical distinction. But the conceptual in in distinction opens out onto even a greater variety of complications. When a distinction is conceptual rather than strictly logical, as seems to be the case with the distinction among senses of history and the distinction in philosophical inquiries into history based on distinct senses of history, the relatively straightforward avenue of logical development is not available to us. But a conceptual distinction misleadingly appears as though it were a simple logical distinction. It looks like we're looking at a concept in this negation, but that's uh, often not the case. We could even name a new logical fallacy based on conflating a conceptual distinction with a logical distinction or vice versa. We could convert the distinctions made by Walsh and Dre and Mandelbaum and Rotenstreich into a logical distinction by taking the concept from one side or other of the distinction and negating it and thereby yielding a logical disjunction. For Rotenstreich, we could take the res geste as the fundamental concept and construct a distinction between res geste and non-res geste. It is only if non-res geste corresponds exclusively and exhaustively with historia rerum gestarum that the conceptual distinction he makes can be reduced to a logical distinction. Otherwise, it is a conceptual distinction. 
Since for Rosenstreich, res geste is forward-looking, as he said in the in the paper that I quoted from, it would be probably more intuitive to take forward-looking as the fundamental concept. And that yields a negation of being non-forward-linking. And we could say then that it is only if being non-forward-linking looking, excuse me, corresponds exhaustively and exclusively with looking at the causal sequence of events that we have a logical distinction. Otherwise, we have four distinctions because we have two distinct concepts, res geste and historia rerum gestorum, and the negation of each of these. And the subtle conceptual differences that get introduced by the different concepts that are employed to mean that different philosophers, uh, excuse me, let me start over with that. The subtle conceptual differences that are introduced by the different concepts that are introduced by different philosophers mean that these different philosophers are going to interpret what appears to be a logical distinction in different ways because they're going to fix on different properties of the concept to the exclusion of others. So since a concept is an abstraction, what we're getting is an abstraction from an abstraction when you take a concept and you derive something from it. And this can lead us in interesting and divergent directions as the concepts are further developed. And in fact, Walsh, Dre, Mandelbaum, and Rosenstreich, all of whom make this apparently simple distinction between sensitive history, between what happened and the account of what happened, all lead us in different directions after beginning with what seems to be the same distinction. In each, in each case, the distinction is developed in a different direction. So enough of that, and I'm going to quote the final paragraph of Between Past and Present, which I thought was striking. Quote, man is a historical being because he is homo sapiens. But Homo sapiens is not an essence created by history. Homo sapiens is the presupposition of history and not in himself an upshot of it. The emergence of Homo sapiens may be considered as an event in the evolution of the concept, but not as an event in the historical process itself. Man is historical precisely because he is more than historical, unquote. So that last sentence is the kind of paradoxical expression that philosophers love. Man is historical precisely because he is more than historical. So what does that mean? Well, I haven't read enough of Rotenstreich yet to tell you exactly what he means by it. But there's many ways that we could prima facie take this passage. And one way would be to interpret it non-naturalistically. But I don't think Rotenstreich intended this for this to intended for this to be read as a non-naturalistic claim about history that that if we're giving if man is is historical only because he is above or outside or transcends history that he's making a non-naturalistic or supernaturalistic claim about uh, homo sapiens i think what he is saying here is more in the tradition of idealist philosophy of history not like the idealism of calling one Collingwood. But this is um, curious because earlier in the book, he criticizes Collingwood's philosophy of history on the basis of the conception of time that's implicit in Collingwood's formulation of history as the reenactment of past thought, and finds that this conception of time in Collingwood fails on Rotenstreich's analysis of time. So he's carrying through this program of relating philosophy of history to a philosophy of time, and he finds that Collingwood fails on this basis. So if Rotenstreich is moving towards some kind of idealism in philosophy of history as implied by the final paragraph of the book I read, it is apparently as different from Collingwood's idealism as it is from Hegel's idealism, and as much as Collingwood's and Hegel's idealism are different from each other. So it's going to be something uh, quite distinct and not necessarily falling into any familiar categories of philosophy of history. So happy birthday, Nathan Rotenstreich. Happy Easter, and thanks for listening. <laughs>